RSK3701, we're looking at the May-June 2016 paper. It's a two-hour paper for 70 marks. Again, you've got three sections here. Section A, 20 multiple choice. Section B, 10 true and false. And then the last question is written. Six paragraph questions. Okay, the first bit we're going to look at is the multiple choice. Question one, a business has a current ratio of 1.5 and an asset test ratio of 1.1. The average current ratio for the um, small businesses in the industry is 2.1 and 1.5 for the asset test. The business has a risk-seeking attitude, so they want to take on more risk. Mm -hmm. And is considering a risk retention program. So they're going to be retaining, so keeping risk, they're going to self-fund it. With due consideration of these ratios and the intention of the business, indicate the correct statement below. The ratios of the business are not favorable. That's incorrect. They are favorable, but they're not better than the industry, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. Higher, a higher level of loss absorption on working capital guidelines is possible. Um, you could maybe consider that one. The business is not in a good position to handle current obligations. No, that's definitely false. Uh, ooh, wrong thing. Pen. There we go. Okay. The ratios are indicative of a high level of mortgage assets. No. Okay. So if we're looking at the average current ratio for a similar business in the industry is 2.1, mm -hmm. not 2.1, oh, 221. I think they're missing two the two semicolon, one. the colon, yeah. the two dots. Okay, I don't, mm -hmm. think, I don't think they've put the two dots in there. So it's 2 to 1 or 1 1.5. All right, so do you agree the business isn't better than the industry, but they are still liquid? Yes, they are. Okay, so the ratio of the business are not favorable. They are favorable. Oh, when compared to industry norms, then that would be true. Yeah, also in for option one. Yes, okay, when compared to industry. Okay, so when compared to the industry, they're not doing well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I sort of shrink this a bit so I can put the answers up as well. Um, let's do this. Okay, there we go. Alright, so question one, I would go with option one. Q11. Okay, question two is looking at, oh, okay, so background around claims, okay, and contracts. All right, so the breaching of a warranty of an insurance contract by the ish insured may result in the repudiation of a claim by the insurer. That's definitely true. Okay, if you yeah. breach a contract, they're not going to enforce it. Mm -hmm. Okay, the preamble of a policy document defines what is covered by the policy. No, the preamble is the introduction, so that tells you who, um, who's in the contract. Um, insurance contracts are based on the premise of caveat emptor. Caveat emptor means let the buyer beware. That's not insurance contract. That's insu uh, that's a sale of a product or a good. So caveat emptor, I wouldn't say is applicable to insurance, but uberima fides, yes, because that's in good faith. Contracts yeah. are contracts in good faith. So mm -hmm. A and D. What did you go with? A and D as well. Okay, good. Okay, so question two. Option four, A and D. Right, an armed robbery at a bank in Johannesburg is a typical example of a... Okay, so if I'm looking at an armed robbery at a bank, is that insurable? Yes, so one is out. Fundamental, does this affect, does this affect everyone? No, it doesn't. It no. only affects the bank, so it would be particular. Do you agree? Yes, I went to that as well. Good. Okay, multi peril policies, um, they obviously cover lots of different risks. Multi peril policies have similar limits are limits of indemnity for the different sections of the policy. Similar limits of indemnity, no, not always, they could have different ones, uh, different sum assured and so on. Cover different mm -hmm. types of perils under each section of the policy, that's a possibility. Have similar terms and conditions for each of the different sections, no, they can have different, sim no. uh, different terms and conditions. Provide limits to cover, no. Option two. Also into that. Okay, great. Question five. An insured has a motor policy with a straight deductible. Okay, so straight deductible meaning that's the amount that they're going to have to self insure. The insured mm -hmm. is involved in a motor car accident sustaining damages of four thousand. The damages will be paid by the insured. A uh, number one. Okay, yeah. Okay, remember if you have a deductible, you're accepting a certain amount of loss before the insurer pays out. Mm-hmm. Okay, just some revision. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the least cost rule is used in determining deductible levels. 
Okay, this is a very specific um, question. Let's just quickly um, check lease cost rule. Okay, takes the financial capacity of the business into account. Okay, takes that the selected deductible should be the one that provides the lowest total expected costs. Okay, that was something we looked at in that table. I don't know if you remember that table. Yes. Okay, yeah. So with the lease cost rule, propose, uh, propose that the cost rule is equal to the insurance premium? No. Falls to judge reasonables? No. Okay, so option two would be the best one because the lowest total expected cost. Yeah, it is the second one. It's in yes. the textbook. Okay, remember we're debating between um, excess or premium basically. Okay. All right, so if you raise your excess, that'll reduce your premium. Do you agree? Okay. Yes. And then with that table, we're looking for the middle ground, where the cost is going to be at the lowest. Okay. Happy with that? Yes. Yeah, that's the self-funding that we covered last week. Okay. Question seven. Mr. Nell pays a premium of your short-term policy every month to his broker. Uh, this even looks like a repeat question. Yeah, this was the yeah. 15 days. Okay, this is a yes. um, C pass paper, October, November 20. 16. Um, okay. Yeah. Right, so we'll, um, So this was within 15 days. Mr. Nell was involved in an accident. Mr. Nell will be covered if the broker um, will not be covered as there's no period. Uh, not be able to claim... Okay, uh, Mr. Nell will not be able to claim from the insurer as his premium. No. Not be covered as there is no period. No. Be covered if the broker was an accredited intermediary of the insurer. Not be covered and will need to claim the money from the broker. It'll be three. Yeah. Okay, he will be able to claim because the grace period of 15 days would be applicable. Okay. Finite insurance or reinsurance. This also looks like a repeat question, but let's check. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, it is. I remember this one from it yesterday. Is. Okay, is yeah. classified as a long-term issue. Uh, has an aggregate limit of cover. Yes, compensation insured for limitation of risk through uh, control procedures takes expected investment income into consideration when calculating premiums. Okay, um, I think we went with B and C for this one. B, C, and D. And D. Okay, so B, yeah. C, and D takes expected investment income into account when calculating premiums. Mm. Okay, question eight was B, C, and D, which, is there an option? Yeah, option four. Okay, finite risk insurance. That would have also been um, the self-insurance part of the textbook. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, number nine. Under motorcycle insurance, the insured is covered while driving a motorcycle that does not belong to him. Provide, no, that's out. Mm -hmm. um, full cover for the motorcycle and passenger liability can be provided by adding a papillion passenger extension to the policy. Can you remember that papillion thing was about the, the, ca the passenger car? Yeah. The car thing. Okay. Um, yes. Accessories and spare parts of the motorcycle are covered when the car, uh, mo when the motorcycle is stolen? No. There is no cover for theft of accessories and spare parts of motor vehicles even when the motorcycle is stolen. Okay. That wouldn't be applicable. You don't. If you have theft cover for your motorcycle, um, in terms of accessories and spare parts, that wouldn't fall under the actual contracts. Okay. Okay, so I'd go with four here. What did you go with? Four. I went to three. Option three. Accessories yeah. and spare parts of the motorcycle are covered when the motorcycle is stolen. Okay, accessories would be extra stuff and spare parts would have been... Um, oh, okay, maybe spare parts as in like... No, but a motorcycle won't have a spare wheel. Motorcycles don't have spare wheels. Um, let's check this then. I think it's two. I think it's two. The full cover for... And oh, you went to four. No, no, no. There is no cover. cover. The, for the it is four, line. sorry. It is four. Yeah, remember the it's on page two or four. Yeah, the other parts are not covered. It's under exclusions. Yes, re yeah, remember the, um, yeah. the, the passenger's never covered. Yeah, it's yeah, so only you got to be the... careful if if, yeah. if if you have someone who has a motorcycle and wants you to ride on the motorcycle, if you get injured or hurt or anything, um, that's your problem, hey? Yes. It's bad, so you got to be very careful. So normally you see people driving around with um, people on their motorcycles. That's a hazard. Yeah. It's a hazard for the passenger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so don't get on those motorbikes if you're a passenger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, um, number nine, um, I just want to check that. 
Okay, I've got motorcycles here. Okay, here. The extension is known as the papillion uh, passenger extension. Yeah, see, that's the extension part. See, no cover for the passenger. And yeah, there's no liability what else is cover. Here? Where's the spare part stuff? Okay, the spare parts aren't even It's here. under exclusions. Under exclusions? Yes. Yeah. Under exclusion. Additional exclusions. The cover under yeah. the motorcycle policy has additional exclusions. No th no cover for theft of accessories or spare parts. Yeah, you, that wouldn't ever be covered. Okay, because yeah. then that's that's almost like a motor plan that's part of your insurance cover. Mm-hmm. Okay, so number nine, option four. Let's go with number ten. Okay, commercial glass insurance provides cover for sheet glass, glass tinker, thicker, sorry, not tinker, thicker, it's an H, thicker than six millimeters, plate glass, and mirrors. All right, it would cover mirrors. Okay, um, glass thicker than six millimeters. We no. need to check that, but I think it is true. And then plate glass would be, so I would go with B, C, and D, but let's check glass insurance. Just to make double sure, um, this is commercial insurance. We saw it yesterday, actually. Yeah, it must be glass not over six millimeters. Is it not over, or yeah. is it over? Let's just check. Um, it's the commercial insurance chapter. It's all we usually quick. not glass over. Ah, commercial insurance. There's it. Glass insurance. Got it. Okay, so where was that point? Let's check. Okay, yeah, there's it there. Uh, although usually not thicker. Okay, so insurance. The insurance provides cover for accidental break, breakage of glass. The cover is really designed for the breakage of plate glass. Okay, which is, we've got that. That's C, that's fine. Yeah. Which are thicker than the sheet glass, which you have in your windows at home. Although usually not for glass over six millimeters thick, which may need special consideration. Okay, there's also cover for damage to windows, plate glass, mirrors, okay, that's fine, okay, so mirrors, definitely, okay, plate glass, definitely, okay, so then it'll be C and D only, option three, yeah, okay, so must be less uh, thinner than six millimeters, okay, um, greater than, greater than six mils, must be considered separately okay I think the reason for that is um, if glass is very thick the likelihood of that breaking would be very unlikely so the glass yeah. insurance would have been a cheaper policy that would cover um, let's say fragile glass All right, and then they'll obviously want to sell you a policy for the thicker glass that might have been more uh, specific to the actual um, structure of the actual business so that'll fall yeah. under the building's insurance. Okay. Okay, because it's thicker glass. Okay, hull insurance is a repeat cov uh, repeat question. We saw that. Remember, just remember the hull is the boat part of the boat, which is the vessel and the machinery. Mm. Okay, question two. Alright, question 12. An insurance policy. Um, in an insurance policy, the fraud, cl the fraud clause... Uh, will be reflected under okay so here we're looking at the clauses general conditions era uh, erative special extensions um, recital clause okay a fraud clause would be something that would be part of um, exclusions no they wouldn't exclude it it could be included so it would be ex specific extensions uh, I've got general conditions general conditions yeah. Okay, let's check. Um, this will be part of the practice of underwriting the contracts. Okay, let's let's find that general conditions. Okay, general conditions of a motive uh, of a policy. Okay, there's it. Okay, so mm, let's see. Where's the note about fraud here? Operative Under the clause. table. Pardon? Um, they have a table in the textbook. Oh, they've got a table in the textbook. Uh, yeah. Under which chapter? So it's, uh, it's under the practice of underwriting. Prince practice of underwriting. Okay, chapter three. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I got that. The subheading is the parts of the policy. 
part of the and policy. Then. Let's find that. Okay, proposal. I've got reasonable man tests. Uh, okay, page one proposal. Um, page three motor inventory rules. Oh, okay. Here's the table. Okay, I've got I've got annual policy. No, these are monthly premiums, and that must be a different table. Oh, here's the other table. General conditions. Ford yeah. clause. Okay, so examples of general conditions. The following are examples of general conditions contained in the policy. Okay, so the fraud clause wouldn't be part of the extensions. It'll be part of the actual general conditions. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so they've actually classified it as being part of that section of that policy. Mm. Okay, so yeah. So one, definitely then. Okay. And that, um, in the new textbook, it's page? Uh, 68. 68, okay. In the old, it's 65. Okay. Great. Let's have a look at number 13. Okay, in terms of a quota share treaty, the reinsurer is bound to accept a fixed portion of every risk. That looks good. The risk is shared on a non-proportional basis. No. Well, it could be, but, oh no, cedent and reinsurer. Um, it's quota share because of the treaty you have to accept. Okay, share of the different parties involved in agreement is expressed as an amount. Um, no, it's a percentage of. Only the amount of excess is said to the no. Okay, so yeah, number one is correct. It's a mm. fixed portion of every risk. It'll be a percentage of. Um, maybe they should, yeah, a, a proportion would mean a percentage. So that's fine. Do you agree with number one? Yes. Okay. Question 14. Indicate the correct statements. All right. So the solvency margin of a company is represented by the capital from shareholders and free reserves of a company. Okay. The remember the solvency margin is what an insurer needs to keep on hand to pay for claims. Okay, policy mm -hmm. holders are usually policy holders usually prefer lower solvency margins. No, policy holders want bigger. That's incorrect. Higher solvency margins indicate a higher utilization of resources. No, it doesn't. It means a lower because these resources are just sitting there waiting to be paid out. Shareholders usually prefer low solvency margins. Yes, they do. Okay, so D and A. Option two. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right, option two is D and A. D is correct for uh, A and D are correct for the uh, for that one. Okay, um, okay. home owners. Okay, when you see the word owner, you should be thinking about the actual house, which is the mm -hmm. infrastructure. Okay, the content um, covers the content of a private dwelling. No, not the content. It's not the content. Okay, all movable property. No, not movable. Business offices. No, immovable property. Yes. Okay, question 15. It's, it's literally the bricks and mortar, anything that's fixed to the actual structure of the home. Agree? Yes. Great. Okay, question 16. In terms of business interruption insurance, okay, this is interruption, so the business has been affected by a loss. Um, gross profit sum insured can be calculated on the following basis. Okay, this was, it was a uh, turnover. Uh, let's see, gross profit less standing charges, turnover plus closing stock minus opening stock, turnover plus standing charges, net profit plus standing charges. I would go with two here. I think this was a repeat question from the other past paper as well. Uh, um, it's uh, actually number four because question two is missing um, and uninsured cost. And you minus the opening cost. stock and okay. un business insurance. Yeah. Okay, let's check this one. Uh, let's go business insurance okay. will be commercial insurance. Okay, yeah. let's find that quick. Okay, we've got theft there, uh, business all risk, money money insurance, glass insurance, fidelity. Um, where's the business stuff? Hmm, not there. It must be earlier on then. Okay, there's it. Business interruption insurance. Okay, they're looking at, what are they looking at here? Gross profit. Okay, so there's the difference basis. And there's the additions basis. So what basis are we looking at here? They didn't say. They didn't okay. mention, yeah. Yeah, so then we would assume it's additions basis. So then net profit plus standing charges would be correct. You're right. Okay, so number four, this is the additions basis, not the, what is the other one? Difference basis. Okay. All right, page 150 old. Um, in your textbook, page... It's page 178. 178 new. Great. Right. Perfect. 
Right, yeah. Um, this looks similar. So was this different to the one we did yesterday? It I was, yeah. Yesterday you had have... the extra one. Yesterday had the different yes. basis one. Yeah. Yeah, so then that's why and they, they, they changed the it. Basis. They just eliminated yeah. the one. Um, it was yeah. turnover plus closing stock, less opening stock, and uninsured costs. Your uninsured costs aren't there. You're right. Good. Okay. Right, question 17. Okay, in terms of marine insurance, okay, marine insurance, the word average means shared loss. Average is qualified by the terms partial or general. General average refers to loss affecting one particular interest. The word average uh, means partial or... Okay, I'm going to have to check this. I'm not too sure. Let's just see marine loss. Okay. Um, okay, here's marine. Okay, I've got particular. Okay, particular average. What are they looking at here? They said the word average means shared loss. General average refers to a loss which is partial when looked at from the total at risk value of the venture. Okay, so that's <clears throat> that's general average. The word average means partial loss. The word average means partial loss. Option number four. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, it's on page 57. Page 57. Emailed file. Right, questions. And, it, yes. and it's also page 45 of the new uh, study guide. Okay, perfect. New study guide. Um, question 18 indicate the correct statement under third party cover no cover is provided for the insured vehicle okay yes that's correct because third party cover is only for problems that arise but let's check the others damage the insured recovered stolen vehicle will not be covered no it will be covered um, the first amount payable under the motor insurance is cumulative in the case of windscreen excess um, windscreen excess. That in terms of the papillion passenger essential liability cover is provided for injuries to passengers. No, that's also out. Never passengers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the only one we need to confirm is the windscreen, the first amount payable for motor insurance. But third party liability cover, if it's third party liability cover, you're covered for third party damages, not for your own vehicle. So it must be number yes. one. Yeah, also went with number one. Okay. Yeah, um, so if I check the uh, motor, motor insurance one, they're probably going to talk about that there. Uh, let's check the motor insurance here. This was for the windscreen. Let's check the first, let's check the windscreen bit there. Um, okay. Okay, that would have been the actual chapter covering motor insurance. Okay, mm. so that covers uh, motor if you insurance. Go okay, to here's motor cars. Uh, in the textbook, they say uh, the first amount payable is cumulative except in the case of windscreen excess. Yes, except. Yeah, so I'm just trying yeah. to find the page reference for that. Um, you've got the page it's reference in your textbook for that already. Yeah. Okay, it's what page 203. is that on? 203. 203. Okay, great. Let's write that one down. New textbook. Okay. All right, question 19. Motor traders external policies. If it's external, it means on the road. So only cover vehicles damage at the premises. No, covers the insured's own vehicle and vehicles in his or her custody. These are external. These are for businesses that conduct um, a trade. Okay, in terms of um, a dealership, can be rated on a wage basis. Cover vehicles temporary garage in the course of a journey. D is definitely correct. Okay, let's check B and C. Covers the insured's the insured's own vehicles and vehicles in his or her custody okay um, can be rated on a wage basis uh, there were two basises here um, I'm gonna check this for you quickly this is trade motor this is commercial vehicles oh I see it will be under first amount motor payable. trade risk it yeah, will I be under pardon <laughs> it's under motor trade risks Yes, okay, so uh, I'm just trying to add some extra references here. Okay, motor trade risks. It's this chapter, motorcycles. Okay, there's motor trade risks. Vehicles for sales belonging to customers, repairers and mechanics. In my textbook, they have it under a table. Yes, Types where the vehicle policy. is covered, external policies and internal policies. 
Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it's in the table on page one seventy nine. Page one seventy nine, old table, and minus two zero seven. Just say that again. Two zero seven. Two zero seven, new textbook table. All right. So yeah, it is there. Um, and they said um, yeah, covers vehicles, temporary garage. That's correct. The insured's own vehicles and vehicles in his custody and control. That is correct. Okay, so, and the basis, let's check the next page. Methods of rating, named driver, tra a trade plate, and weight basis. So that's also correct. So, B, C, and D, option two. Okay. Happy with that? Yes. Okay. Question 20. An insurer enters in a quota share agreement with the seating insurer, retaining 60% of any loss. Okay, so they're retaining 60% of any loss. How much will the insurer pay if the loss amounts to 80 under a 100,000 policy? Okay, so 80% of 60 is retained. The insurer would have to pay that, 48,000. Yes. Yeah. Of eighty thousand is forty eight thousand. Okay, you also went with that one, hey? Yes. Nice. Okay. Um oh and that's the end of the multiple choice really. Wow. That yeah. was good. Sure. Okay. Alright, so that was multiple choice. Now we need to look at true and false. True slash false. Okay. Section B. Alright, so question number one, let's see what the focus is here. Okay, insurable interest enforces the principle of indemnity. Okay, insurable interest needs to have um, a, you have to have like a relationship between the insured, okay, and the event that could arise in terms of loss. Okay, so when look at the principle of indemnity, indemnity is putting the person back in the place they were before. Right, mm -hmm. so I don't agree with that because there are two different concepts. Yes. Okay, so that's false. Right, what I would do here is I would either explain, so I would say insurable interest is, and then I'll give the definition. Okay, let me get a page reference for you. So there's something that, sh that you can use. Um, Insurable interest would have been covered in the first bit. Principles of underwriting would have been chapter 3. Yeah. Practice of underwriting. Where's insurable interest? Premiums. Inventory. Ah, insurable risk. Okay, no. Insurable interest. There we go. Okay, then I would define what it is. Okay, page 44 old. Um, and in your textbook, page? Page 70. Page 70 new. Okay, page 70 new. Right, so they, they discuss it. Just to recap, maybe to do some revision, insurable interest is the legally recognized relationship between the insured and the financial loss. Okay, we mentioned that. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, it's just the relationship. That's the key bit. Okay, I would focus on relationship here. Okay, and then indemnity, I would describe what that is. So indemnity, indemnity is putting the insured back in the position that they were in before the loss. Okay, that's the principle of indemnity. I would describe that. Um, I think they'll be flexible here with your answer. I don't think they'll mind which way you do it in terms of do you either talk about insurable interest or you do talk about indemnity. They're two different concepts, so it's definitely false. Okay. Happy? Yes. Okay, let's look at question two. Okay, another farmer question here. Uh, it might even be the same question, but yeah, let's discuss similar. it. Similar, yeah. Yeah, similar, okay. Yeah. A farmer insures his crop for 90. Okay, so he has insurance for 90,000. All right, the value of the crop is 125. The loss is 50. The principle of special condition of average applies. 40,000 will be payable to the insured. Okay, so let's check... What is 75% of 90,000? Mm. 
sixty-seven five hundred. Yeah, sixty-seven five hundred. Um, the loss that was sustained was fifty thousand. That's less than. Less than. Uh, or fifty. Fifty thousand is less than the sixty-seven five hundred. Okay, so would they pay out the full amount? Uh, no. Special okay. condition. Uh, fifty thousand is less than the sixty-seven five hundred. They will pay out. Yeah, they mm -hmm. will pay out. Let's yeah. um, let me quickly bring that up that page. Okay, let's let's, let's go special condition. Um, do you remember what page we spoke about it yesterday? I, I forget now. Uh, what page number was. Um, it's under you. contracts. Okay, let me find it here. I'll search for it. It's page fifty-eight, emailed file. There we go. Yeah, mm -hmm. special condition of average. In the case of a 75% condition of average is applied, example, agriculture, produce, and farms, the insured will share in the loss only if the sum assured is less than the stated percentage. Okay, so is this less than? Yes, it is less than. So the insured will share. Okay, so there will be a payout. Okay, so if they share, it'll be how much um it'll be okay so the insured will share the insured will pay insured pays uh or let me write this down insurer insurer pays how much is the loss 50000 times 90 over 125 Okay, because they're only going to pay a portion of it. Okay, what is that? 50 times 90 over 125 is... Okay, so this is false. It's 36,000. Okay, I think it was... Uh, what did we have in the previous one? Uh, they had different figures. Yeah, they had uh, different figures. So, uh, I yeah. think, was it true or false in that past paper? Let's go back and check. It was true. Okay, so yeah, so we went with true in October, November. Uh, let's open up that paper. Okay, so here's the October, November paper. Let's go to the... Long questions. There's it. Okay, oh, there were different figures even. Okay, I thought yeah. it was the same question, just different figures, but it's a different it's question. Similar, yeah, it's similar, yeah. Yeah, right, so we can't actually refer to that one to to um as a simulate uh, as a similar question I, I wanted to show i thought maybe they went false in the one and then true in the other but the same question it wasn't the case okay all right so in this case forty thousand will be payable by the insurer no thirty six thousand will be paid by the insurer false okay the farmer insures the crop the value of the crop is that the loss of 50 was that Okay, they would only pay a share because it's less than the 67,500. So yeah, that would be fine. Happy with that? Yes. Okay, um, I need to write the right numbers here. 1.1, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.
Question 5. Money transported to and from the bank is covered under Fidelity Guarantee Insurance. Um, that is true. And there are some other scenarios as well. It's, I think it's uh, in the safe as well. Let's double check. Okay, Fidelity Guarantee Insurance. Let's go Commercial okay. Insurance. Just to make sure. Um, where is that? Let's find it. Business Interruption. Multi peril. Oh no, further on. Okay, there's it. Okay, Fidelity Guarantee Insurance. Oh, hold on a sec. I was thinking money insurance. This is false. Fidelity Guarantee is infidelity. That means fraud and corruption. Yeah. Okay, I'm not even following my own rules. <laughs> okay, remember, <laughs> think about this. When you see that word, you think infidelity. That's what, that was the that was what we remembered it with. Remember. Yes. Infidelity. Yes. Okay, so yeah, that's just, this is false. Sorry, mistake there. False, okay, fidelity, guarantee, G-U-A-R-A-N-T, insurance, it's is fraud. cover for fraud and corruption. Yes. Basically fraud, when employees are stealing from the business, basically. Theft of, theft and money, uh, theft, uh, of money and goods from the business by employees. Okay, uh, money transported to and from the bank, that's money insurance. Let's just check money that. Insurance. Let's double check, yeah. make sure. Uh, yes, money insurance um, at the insured's premises or being transferred. Yeah, so you can decide how you want to motivate this. Money insurance is the cover for money transported to and from the bank yes perfect okay so yeah two options there in terms of correcting it okay here they're talking about ex gratia payments okay remember when we covered the theory theory ex gratia means the insurer is willing to pay a claim that doesn't or isn't covered under the policy okay yes. so is this a compensation payment no no okay it's not a compensation no, it is a compensation. No, well, a compensation payment is referred to a policy. So let me write a note here. Okay, false. Ex gratia is a, inverted commas, like a gift, a gratuitous payment. Mm -hmm. I hope I spelled that right. Is that right? Gratuitous. Yes. Okay, it looks right. Mm -hmm. Okay, gratuitous payment from the insurer this isn't a claim okay so I think they're referring to compensation payment as being a claim compensation payment is a claim All right so then it would be false if if we assume because remember if it's ex gratia they're compensating you for something that has occurred Okay, or they're paying for the loss. They're indemnifying you. Okay, so if you, if you, um, if your assets were stolen um, and it wasn't covered on the policy, they might pay ex gratia to compensate you for your loss. Okay. Okay, ex gratia doesn't affect your claims history. Okay. Okay, it doesn't affect claims history. I've seen questions like that come up before where they talk about the claims history. Um, I want to find it here in the question, um, ex gratia, just to... Just to check that um, the ex gratia, the, um, the, okay, there's ex gratia. It's under payment. claims procedures. Yes, it's chapter 6. Okay, let me find yeah. chapter 6. Claims procedure, ex gratia payments. Okay, got it here. Okay, in insurance, there are times when a claim is not covered for technical reasons or where there has been a genuine misunderstanding. If this is unfair to the insured, the company will pay either the full loss or part of it. It's known as an ex gratia payment. See, that's what it is. Okay. Um, okay, if you look at the next page, an ex gratia payment is not an indemnity payment, and therefore subrogation and contribution cannot be applied. An ex gratia payment for one claim does not mean um, the same loss will be covered in future. Ex gratia payments is made without prejudice um, by insurers, and therefore is not affected. See, it doesn't affect your f um, future claims. Right, they don't even talk about compensation <laughs> there. Okay, so, yeah, but it's definitely yeah. not if we assume compensation is referring to the actual payouts. Okay. Okay, is that all right? Yes. Number um, 
Okay. An insured has um, an insured has a policy with a ten thousand deductible and a recapture factor of five. Should a loss of fifty be sustained, the insured will pay the full deductible. Okay. This is something that we spoke about, and we used that formula from the actual textbook. Okay, so let me get that yes. formula back from the textbook. Let me get it here. Um, where is it? Recapture, recapture factor. There's it. Okay, so copy that. Alright, so this is the actual formula. <clears throat> Let's copy paste. Okay, so that's what I used to do the calculation. Okay, mm -hmm. I write down the formula, P equals L minus D times 1 minus R. Okay, so P is the payment by the insurer. So, insurer payment equals, open brackets, what was the loss? 50,000. Minus, what was the deductible? 10. Close brackets, times, 1 minus, no, plus, um, it's 1 plus, 0.05 close brackets equals okay if I calculate that on the calculator I get an amount of 42,000 okay yes. so should a loss of 50 be sustained the insured will pay the full deductible no okay the insured the insured will pay 10,000 no 50,000 minus 42,000 equals 8,000. The insured pays 42. The insured pays 8. So this would be false. Happy? Yes. Okay. Right, so the insured pays the 8 and the insurer pays the 42. Because of the recapture factor. 1.8. An underwriter is requested to underwrite a tire plant. Uh, sums insured. Fire 80 million. Loss of profits 40. The underwriter has a net line of 5 million and can take an additional 50 if the risk involves fire and loss of profit. The underwriter has a 9 line surplus treaty. Okay, so it'll be 5 million plus 9 times 5 million equals 9 times 5 is 45 plus 5 is 50 million okay so 50 million line of reinsurance available okay um, we need to add the 50 plus add 50 percent additional um, what is 50 percent so 50 percent of fire and loss of profit so 50 percent of 120 million Okay, is 60 million. Alright, so 50 plus 60 total is 110 million. Okay, so how much was the loss here? 120. Okay, so loss is 120 million. Will they be facultative? Yes, they will. The underwriter will need no, that's false. Okay. There will be facultative insurance, reinsurance of 10 million. Okay, the 110 million is covered under the treaty. Okay, um, this is probably a surplus quoted treaty. Okay, it's a nine line surplus treaty. Yeah, there's it. Okay, um, 10 million will be facultative. Happy? Do you agree? Yes. Okay, great. Right, uh, 1.9. Okay, Mr. Nglovu is an electrician. Apart from the working tools he carries with him, he also carries wires and pipes, and in many cases, electrical equipment that needs to be fitted at a client's premise. In terms of goods in transit, insurance, the working tools, pipes, wires, and uh, okay, no, it's not all covered. Okay, we. I think this is even a repeat question. Yeah. Okay, so false. GIT insurance only covers the client-specific materials. Okay, tools slash equipment 
must be covered under business or risk. Yes. Okay, and that would be a motivation for that one. Happy? Yes. Okay, <coughs> Mr. Naidu had a personal accident policy. He worked in a mine as a shaft manager during one of the shifts he was killed in an explosion. Okay, his wife will be able to claim the benefit from the policy. Yes, she would. Yes. Okay, so that's true. Okay, mm -hmm. so true. Right, um, the claim will be valid. Okay. Happy with that? Yes. Great. Right. Uh, oh, okay, that's the end of that one. Nice. Okay, we're doing really well. We're doing a, we're doing a lot better this time round um, <laughs> than yesterday. Yeah. Okay, it's going a bit quicker um, because we've we've seen similar questions come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's always the case. Um, they 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 tend they tend to be a bit of um, overlap in terms of questioning. Okay, when it comes to the actual, um, uh, how can I say testing yeah. okay, of the of the actual concepts. Yeah. All right. So, explain five purposes of an insurance proposal form. Okay, let's find the reference for you. Um, proposal form. I think it's page 30 of that email study guide. Yes, I'm looking for it. I'm going to get it soon. Let's just quickly offer an acceptance. Um, the six main functions. Did they want functions? Explain the five purposes. More than one purpose. The following are the six main functions. Okay, so uh, page 30. Yeah, did you say page 30? Yeah. Yes, okay. Page 30 of the emailed file okay um, on page 30 they give you they talk about six functions they say the they say the propose the proposal form has more than one purpose okay the following are the six main functions of the proposal form okay then they talk about the parties must be competent okay there needs to be legal uh, le um, what do they call it? Uh, sure, I forget the what's the legal term. Um, oh, legal capacity. That's it. Okay, legal capacity to enter in contract, um, and that's it. Yeah. Okay, so that would be the best thing to use. Um, I would use those six points. Okay, so let me take that through here. Okay, just so you've got that there. Okay, there's the notes. Okay, and then let's get number three as well. Three, four, five, and six. Okay, so I do think they're probably referring to that. They said the five purposes. Um, purposes could be functions. Okay, functions and purposes are pretty similar, um, so they would be describing those. Okay, so five of the six. Okay. Let's look at the next one. Question number three. Question three. Right, your friend, Mr. B purchases a motor car and insures it with two different insurance companies for its full value. He argues that if something should happen to the car, he would be sufficiently insured as well as to be able to profit from the insurance. Okay, that's obviously false. Mm -hmm. Okay. False. Alright. Um, you cannot profit from insurance claims. Okay, you cannot be put in a better position than when you were before. Okay, um, that would have been covered under betterment. Betterment um, in the old textbook here is on page 102. Okay, um, and it also would have been part of the indemnity as well. They probably would have mentioned it there as well. Okay. Okay, in terms of not being able to profit. Yeah. You, you're never allowed to profit from a claim for insurance. Okay, but in some instances you do, but it's allowed. For example, if your vehicle is damaged, obviously they give you a similar make and model. Obviously that similar make and model might have certain features that your old vehicle didn't have, but then that's seen as part of the betterment. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're not allowed to profit from it, but if the asset that they've, if the if it's the if it's the asset that they're indemnifying you for, okay, so if your car is stolen or damaged or written off, and your <coughs> car is replaced, if the car is better than, uh, obviously the car will be a newer model. So if it's a newer model than the older one, that's that's fine because you still have a car. You didn't profit from the actual transaction. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so I would be discussing those concepts. Maybe just to give some other things. Maybe you could discuss betterment. Okay, as a discussion point. Okay, um, betterment is on page 102 in the old. Um, do you have a reference for it? It, it covers under claims procedure. Claims procedure. That's the chapter. Okay. okay. You'll probably find it under that chapter in your textbook. Under claims procedure, uh, there's, a, there's a short paragraph called betterment there. Can you check if okay. it's there as well for you? Okay, I'll check now. Yeah, it's in the claims procedure chapter. Um, it's probably chapter 6, round about chapter 6, aren't we there? Mm -hmm. Do you have it? Um, I found the chapter. I'm just looking okay, awesome. for. Uh, okay, betterment? I've got betterment. It's page it? 126. Yeah. Okay, perfect. You got it. Yeah. So that's that's something to consider. That's something that you could also explain. Uh, what page was it in your chapter textbook? 126. 126. 126. Brilliant. Okay. Safe. Right. But are you happy with three? Yeah. Okay, so evaluate the merit of the above argument. Okay, I would talk about, um, uh, you could even talk about indemnity versus compensation. Okay, mm. that's also something that you could argue here about. Okay, because indemnity means what? Put you in the place that you were before. Correct. Put you in the same position that you were before. To indemn uh, indemnify. Indemnify. Uh, nify, dem, um, ooh, I'm sure, spelling, let me check the spelling, okay, I-N-D-E-O, M-N, that's it, M-N-T-I-T, -T. okay, indemnity versus compensation, okay, right, so indemnity is when you indemnify a person by putting them back in the position they were before, and that's where the principle of betterment can apply, okay, so if you get a vehicle, that's a newer make and model, but it's still in line with the vehicle in terms of cover that you got. It's just your benefit in terms of betterment. Okay, but the principle is you cannot profit from a, a vehicle. So, for example, um, was this guy was the, uh, was this guy insured by two companies? Yes. Yes, insured by two companies. Will both companies pay out? Yes, but only a portion. Correct. Both will only pay a portion for one vehicle. Right, so even though you've got two policies with two different insurers, you're actually wasting premiums by, by covering your vehicle twice. Okay, because exactly. now you're paying two premiums for the same vehicle. It just doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah. Okay, so in that case, if you are damaged, uh, if, you, if your vehicle is damaged in the, in the accident, okay, will you get two vehicles back? No. <laughs> it would be nice if you could, but you can't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So paying two premiums for two different insurance policies makes no sense because you're never going to get two vehicles if only one vehicle was damaged. Yes, true. All right. And that's why taking out more than one policy is pointless when it comes to short-term insurance because you can't benefit any more than one vehicle. Mm -hmm. Right. So why a person would have two policies... I have no idea. It might be because maybe they didn't cancel the one and maybe they moved from one insured to another. Okay, that could be problematic. Okay, but they should cancel the policy if you're moving from one place to another. Yes, true. Okay. All right. Uh, question four. Let's check what the focus is here. Okay, a broker is approach, uh, approached by a client who wishes to underwrite an extensive risk exposure. Okay. The broker is aware that the exposure is beyond the capacity of a single insurer. 
suggest alternative options available um, in the short term market for insurers to cover risk exposures uh, of such a nature. Okay, you could look at collective insurance. Okay. Okay, so where you've covered you've covered multiple um, items, okay, for that particular asset. Okay, so it's underwriting. Let me go find collective insurance. I think we even mentioned collective insurance yesterday as well. Yeah. I think we spoke about it. Um, let's check it here. Collective. Collective. Okay. Collective insurance. Um, it's under renewals. Explain reinsurance and collective insurance. Okay. So, what chapter is this? Chapter. Um, chapter 1 looks like it. Collective insurance. Chapter 1. Let's check. Reinsurance, loss adjustment. No, it can't be chapter one. Um, let's look for another reference. Collective insurance. Okay, here's it. Chapter five, renewals. Okay, that's all they have in this um, file. Okay, there's not too much here. Um, do you have a better reference for collective uh, insurance? The only thing I found was uh, on page 278, which was at the end of the textbook. I didn't find anything else on collective insurance. Okay. Um, let's think about um, this then. Brokers approach by a client who wishes to underwrite an extensive exposure. The broker is aware that the exposure is beyond the capacity of a single insurer. Yeah, so you, you're going to have multiple. So there will be, there will be multiple insurers helping to cover the risks okay um, yeah it, it should be collective insurance yeah it is something on page 278 of the new textbook it says explain the features of a collective policy okay so and the points under there is like they tell you each insurer has a share of the risk yes. the lead insurer issues the policy, um, the policy reflects each insurer's share, the claims are handled by the lead insurer, the other insurers normally follow the lead, the collective insurer cannot quote against the lead, the lead insurer receives a handling free fee from the other insurers who share the risk. Perfect, yeah, that's brilliant. Okay, so I would be discussing yeah. those points under here because um, we know that this one insurer can't cover all the risks. So collective insurance is applicable. Yeah, so it was question four in uh, October, November 2016 paper. Okay, so the same That's as the well. Same. Yeah. All right, so also similar to October, November 2016. Okay, question. see new textbook, page... 278. Yes, perfect. Okay, use that. Use those points as motivation right um what else could we discuss here? i don't think there's anything else they just said suggest alternative options available in the short term market for insurers to cover risk exposure of such a nature maybe they're also looking at those other options okay those other um products so um if we go back to the last chapter self-funding Okay, so you can't, you can't, so for example, okay, let me put this here. Okay, we cannot get enough cover from one insurer. Okay, so the alternative, collective insurance. Okay, get other insurers to help cover. Okay, something else that you might also want to consider, I don't know if they will, they just said alternative options. Okay, how many marks do we get for each of these? Okay, five marks is a lot. So maybe it's worthwhile discussing it. Okay, we know self-insurance can cover any risks. Okay, so if it's too risky to insure it with an insurer, the other option is also self-insurance. Okay, and here you could be considering captives and rent captives even. Okay, I don't think it's the focus of this question, but you never know. 
Okay, they've given you enough space. It's worthwhile maybe mentioning it. Okay, I don't know where they're going to be allocating the five marks because they just said suggest alternative options. So, an alternative option would definitely be this, lead insurer, collective insurance. And an alternative option would be, well, self-fund it yourself. Okay, if it's too big of a risk to cover by one insurer, well, then you might have to self-fund it yourself. Okay. Okay, and that's that's just something to consider as an alternative. Okay, so an alternative would be to self-insure it. Okay. Okay. Number five. An important function of the claims negotiator in the short-term market is to raise an estimate against claims that have been notified. Explain why this function is so important and highlight the impact of incorrect claims estimates to insurers. Okay, remember in, uh, claims estimates, um, just want to write this down, claims estimates um, uh, affect the, the ratios, the margins, the solvency ratios slash margins. Okay, so remember they need to keep a certain amount of capital. Mm-hmm. Capital margins. Okay, that'll definitely affect the claims. Um, the claims estimate would definitely affect that. Okay, if we look at the claims negotiator. Okay, um, I'm gonna have to find a reference for that. Let's get a reference for the detail. Okay, negotiator. Uh, claims. Claims. N e g o t i a t o r. Uh, it's not finding it. Okay, claims. Okay, claims, claims, claims. Not there. Not there. Claims departments. Claims handling. Okay, it's probably under claims handling. So perhaps under that chapter. Study Unit 3, what chapter is this? Short-term insurance, Topic 2. Okay. Claims Procedure. I think it might be under Claims Procedure. Let's check there. Claims Procedure. Uh, we're looking for... Claims Negotiator. Where is that heading? Ah, Claims Department. Claims Notification client's responsibility. Okay, no, not there. Alright, um, do you have a reference for it? I don't, actually. Also not. Okay, so let's look for it. Let's find one. Um, litigation, claims, procedure, prescription, um, reduction, no. Okay, so next option, let's find another chapter that has that. Alright, so in terms of this question's focus, an important function of the claims negotiator in the short-term insurance market is to raise an estimate against claims that have been notified. Explain why this function is so important and highlight the impact of incorrect claims. Okay, so I think we're focusing too much on the claims negotiator. If we're yeah. focusing on the claims estimates... Okay, um, there is a textbook reference here. So page 114 old, and in yours? 139. 139 new. Okay, and there they, they talk about it. So in the short-term uh, market, it's important function of the claims negotiator. See, there's the word. Mm -hmm. Claims negotiator. To raise an estimate against claims that have been notified. The estimate should be realistic as the insurer has to put... Um, his money in reserve. Okay, yeah, we spoke about the margin ratios. Okay, the reserve mm -hmm. slash reserve. Okay, so yeah, that's definitely the right page. Okay, so if it's too high, the company is reserving money that could have been used for the expansion of the business. It affects the insurance solvency margin, as indicated later. The loss ratio of the company looks worse than it actually is. Right, all of that's important. Mm -hmm. Okay, happy with that one? Yes. All right, yeah. So, NB, focus 
on the claims estimates. All right, and then in the paragraph they spoke about the claims negotiator. That's where I saw the word. Okay, so yeah. it's in the textbook. Okay, I think you're probably also looking for that. You probably remember seeing it somewhere. Yes, I was. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we found it. There's it. Finally. Okay. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, question six. Let's save that. Let's continue. Um, what's the next question focusing on? Okay. Oh, ooh, this is a graphical presentation. Okay, so now they're asking for what they gave in the textbook. I'll show you where to get this. Okay, graphic graphically present three categories of losses based on possible frequency and severity. All right, this is literally a copy paste of what they've asked yeah. in their previous exam paper. I think in 2013, 2015, 2014, in one of them, they asked for diagrams. Okay, so this is the same picture. Okay, the picture comes from um, the the emailed page. Okay, it's this picture here. Okay, copy that, paste that here. Right, that's the that's the picture. Yeah. All right, it's on page ninety-eight of the emailed file. All right. Um, you might have even referenced the same thing, did you? Yes, I got the same thing. Okay, awesome. Okay, so graphically present three categories of losses. Right, remember, losses can either have a high severity or a high frequency. Okay, remember, severity and frequency is going to affect the decision-making around which losses are we going to cover and which losses aren't we. Okay, okay. severity versus frequency. All right, so they said graphically represents, they actually want you to draw that diagram. Um, based on the possible frequencies, which will indicate the funding strategy to be followed for each category. Okay, so now here they also want the funding strategy as well. Okay, which is look at the cost of insurance. Okay, so um, uh, there's predictability as well. There's another diagram here which is looking at the predictability. Okay, mm -hmm. I would use that as well. If you can remember them, try use them as well. Okay, so this applies to the, um, how can I say, the, um, it's looking at the ability to, uh, to, it's predictability, so it's the ability to recognize or identify, identify the, the event, okay, the accuracy, the accuracy, accuracy of spotting those losses. Okay, it's like, it's like identifying. So the, predictabi the predictability, how, how predictable are those losses? Okay, so losses type 1, type 2, type 3. Okay, obviously it's easy to predict those losses that are occurring frequently. Okay, so if you're seeing um, theft of goods and services in the in the retail um, the retailer, okay, that's easy to pick up. Okay, uh, type three losses are the ones that are difficult to pick up because those are very severe. Okay, so we don't know if an earthquake is going to hit the factory. Yeah. Okay, if they're focusing on the funding strategy to be followed for each category on the graph, then I do think they're focusing more on this one, which is focusing on the costs. Okay, so this diagram is focused on the cost of insurance. Okay, so those losses that we have that we need to insure, okay, the funding strategy would be, are we going to be going with excess or deductibles? Brackets, again, you could talk about self-funding. Okay, versus... Transferring the risk. Transferring the risk to an insurer. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can find anything else here. I think that should cover it. Let's just check. Yeah. 
Okay, type 1 and type 2, if you want to, you can maybe give some detail about that. Um, for 5 marks, that should be enough. I think the diagram will count quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, it'll probably be more of the focus because they wanted you to graphically represent it. Okay, if you want to, you can maybe go on further and you can talk about um, self-funding. You can talk about reasons why you'd want to self-fund, but that might be a little bit too much. But, um, yeah, there should be enough there to um, to get five marks. Is that okay? Okay, yes. Okay. Right, next question. Number seven. Okay, we need more space. Okay, question seven. Alright, what's the focus here? Identify and briefly explain five key input factors to consider when performing a feasibility study for setting up a captive. Okay, this came out straight of the UNISA study guide. Okay, we go to captives. Okay, captives. Alright, what is a captive? How do they work? We want the key input factors. Alright, so... Reasons for establishing a captive. Identify and briefly explain five key input factors to consider when pro performing a feasibility study. Okay, this is looking at the cost. Okay, um, the the extent to which we should go in terms of raising the the feasibility studies. Key input factors. It's on page one one six. Okay, let's highlight that. Copy that. Okay, page 116 of the emailed notes from UNISA, UNISA emailed file, UNISA file, copy paste. Okay, key input factors uh, to the feasibility study, there's three there, four there, um, I need the rest on the other page. Uh, oh, there's a lot, there's seven even. Okay, so they only want five. Yeah. All right, so that's good. You've got some, yeah. uh, you've got some room for flexibility in terms of, um, uh, obviously it's going to be difficult to remember all seven, but as long as you remember five of the seven and you can explain them, you, then you should be fine. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Right, um, next question. Done. Ooh, that's it. Okay, great, perfect, nice. Yeah. Well done, that was not bad, hey? Not too bad. It wasn't bad. Yeah, it wasn't as bad um, because I think we, we've covered one already. Um, so we took it slow. We went through some revision. We explained some of the concepts. Um, so it's a bit better now because um, I see you've done lots of um, um, earmarking of pages and that, which is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you can see what the popular questions are. Chances yeah. are they're probably going to be testing either the exact same things but just worded differently. Um, or they might give you one or two other things. But remember, this, the, the self-insurance chapters toward the end of the textbook, the study guide, those are very important because the long questions you can see, they focus on that. Yeah. Okay, so if you can try, maybe read through those uh, last few chapters in the actual study guide, the UNISA study guide, uh, because those are the types of questions they'll probably ask you uh, in the written part of the exam. Okay. 